स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया this course is about formal semantics so it is uh, we'll uh, we'll see what semantics is uh, the word formal already suggests that it's going to be somehow mathematical what i mean by that is somehow formal so it will have a lot of symbols and operations and all that stuff and uh, we start today and uh, in the beginning we'll see a bit of history and also a bit of philosophy and uh, we can understand that formal semantics is not a uh, homogeneous monolithic thing it is very very heterogeneous but still uh, so it is actually uh, it's an interaction between mathematics philosophy logic and definitely linguistics so many disciplines come together to and not just that so there are so many other tools that are taken uh, from here and there so then we have this discipline called formal semantics and we shall see a little bit of uh, history of uh, this discipline in the beginning so we we shall first see what semantics is we want to sort of locate semantics in the map of linguistics so the core areas of linguistics are phonology morphology syntax and semantics we know that uh, very roughly uh, we need we need to understand a bit of uh, all these four because somehow all these will be there but for us this is going to be our central topic and this is going to be almost central to everything these two are also very important but uh, need not be important all the time now phonology it studies the speech sounds of a language it is based on phonetics which is the study of general speech sounds and their production phonology also studies the rules for combining speech sounds for example when you have in english hit you because you is palatal the production does not have any t it becomes hit you right so this thing is pronounced as ch kind of hit you so this is a phonological rule it is based on some phonetic principle so it is basically palatalization all these processes so not only the speech sounds of a language are studied uh, by a phonologist also these changes these conversions changes transformations all these things are studied in phonology then uh, we go to the next we have morphology uh, more it this actually studies morphemes what is a morpheme a morpheme it, not just morphemes it studies two things morphemes and their relations that is when two or more mor morphemes uh, come together to make uh, to make a word and all that stuff a uh, morpheme is a minimum meaningful unit thus the word men you can see that men is one word but it is not one unit actually it is two units it has got two morphemes namely man and the english plural morpheme the question is how do they unite and make the word men not that all the time when two uh, suppose two morphemes uh, come together to make one word not that all the time they are explicit not that all the time you can see both uh, so they are uh, they are zero modification cases also for example um i give you uh, just one so i just say that uh, john saw tom and john saw him now look at the difference here him it is clearly he plus the accusative english accusative case right which makes it he and this that makes it uh, that makes it him here also it is there 
but it is there as zero modification. It does not modify Tom physically, but still it is there. So when we uh, we consider this case, we cannot say it is just bare minimum Tom or it is just naked Tom. It is Tom plus something, the accusative marker, which is not visible, but which is there. All these things are studied uh, in, in morphology. And syntax, anyway, we'll have a detailed uh, consideration. We'll have a detailed session on syntax, which basically will be based on Chomsky syntactic structures. So uh, it is the study of the concatenation of words. When words combine, uh, when wo words are combined together to make phrases and sentences, how do they, so the rules of combinations, those rules are studied uh, by a syntactician. The main question, how are the grammatical sentences and phrases made? And how are they different from, from non-grammatical phrases and sentences? Finally, we'll talk about semantics. Uh, roughly speaking, this is the study of the meaning of a linguistic expression. Some very important questions. What is the meaning of the proper noun Montague? What is the meaning of a common noun like man? What is the meaning of a verb? such as goes. What is the meaning of, of the sentence Montague goes there? So meaning is the most important concern for semantics. So here is a dictionary definition or rather an encyclopedic definition of it. It's there in Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, semantics is the philosophical and scientific study of meaning in natural and artificial languages. So uh, we we also, in our ordinary lives, we do some semantics. For example, when we talk about synonymy uh, or uh, we talk about uh, synonymies, for example, uh, uh, there are two phrases are synonymous when they have the same meaning. For example, unmarried man and bachelor, they're synonyms. And uh, there are many such things, many such meaning relations. And uh, antonyms are opposed to each other as far as meanings are concerned. So uh, we all, already we deal with a lot of semantics in our everyday life. Uh, we shall now see uh, what semantics was before, uh, before Montague, before Richard Montague, uh, the man who pioneered the discipline we're going to see that is Montague semantics. It's called Montague semantics. So we will see different attitudes in the study of uh, semantics. First of all, it is the referential theory. This is definitely the oldest theory. And uh, in the Western uh, academia and Western philosophy, basically, Plato uh, puts it this way uh, in his Cratylus. Uh, he says that the meaning of a word is whatever it refers to. For example, I just say a sense, it directly refers to a place. So, uh, so the point is uh, a word, the meaning of a word is an object. But this is not a very easy position to maintain. Why not? Because I understand that the meaning of uh, London or a sense is an object or the meaning of uh, uh, something else, sun or moon, all these words, the meanings of these are very clear. But what about goes, for example? What about good? What about bad? So it is not a very, uh, at least the way it comes to us, is not very clear. Then we see modified versions of this theory. One such is Mill's theory. So he wrote a very famous book called John Stuart Mill. He wrote a very famous book called System of Logic. In that, he talks about connotation and denotation. Even in the naive language, non-technical language, people talk about connotation and denotation, but they don't, they don't mean the same thing as, uh, as the philosopher means by uh, this dichotomy, connotation and denotation. Basically, connotation is something associated with a word. Uh, it is a guide. It is a guide that uh, that that leads us to its denotation. For example, when somebody says "cat," 
something happens to me some i'm guided in a certain way and as a result of that i can categorize an animal as a cat so that associated thing is connotation and what is denotation denotation is a cat right uh, an object so uh, that we can understand very easily so but the problem is what kind of a thing connotation is this is not a very um, easy question some people said it was a mental object some people said no it was not mental it was real but it was anyway problematic uh, mill also said uh, some very uh, very uh, curious things for example uh, uh, he was of the opinion i'm not going to support or uh, deny what he said i'm just mentioning what he said for example he said that proper nouns like john or tom or ram are not connotative they're denotative what does that mean they refer to something yes but they they don't have any meaning because they don't have any connotation so for example uh i can uh i can name my son anything i i can i can name my ugly son uh beauty i, I can do anything right so it doesn't mean that uh the meaning or uh my 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 daughter who uh, never wins a game i can I, i can name my daughter victoria which means that uh, somebody who has victory but uh, she she never saw victory in life even then i call her victoria so uh, the the connotation of victory has nothing to do uh, with the object that is uh, that is in this case uh, victoria so uh, proper nouns according to mill were just denoting but Uh, this referential theory so what is the basis of it the, so the main point is uh, there is a word and then the meaning of that uh, so the the first version is directly it is an object and the modified version there is a word and so there are two different things sometimes through through the connotation of it it chooses an object as a denotation or sometimes it directly chooses an object and uh, so these are non connotative these are the non connotative types and uh, this is the connotative type so this is roughly the referential theory i don't claim that these are sort of technically correct definitions but these are just uh, very rough uh, ideas so then we go to the next one the ideational theory we understand that meanings seem to have or uh, linguistic elements expressions seem to have kind of uh, kind of mental things at least they seem to be mental why because uh, some understanding is all the time involved in the case of meaning we understand meaning meanings are there in our understanding right so that is the reason many philosophers and thinkers thought that meanings were mental elements so for example john locke the british empiricist locke claimed that meanings uh, are ideas associated with a word so when i say something as a speaker i encode the idea in a word and then because we have some shared knowledge some common knowledge uh, it can be decoded by my hearer so um so but primarily meanings are not so this is non referential because uh, the whole dimension here the whole uh, the whole uh, focus is different right the focus is yes meanings are basically ideas associated with words they are not objects so that is why it is called uh, the ideational theory and then another very uh, dramatically different theory Uh, different from uh, the last two this is the behaviorist theory what is that so it was pioneered by uh, structuralists like bloomfield who, who did uh, great things uh, in the field of uh, linguistics and b f skinner we just take uh, something by skinner this is a quote from encyclopedia britannica once again now i just read it out and then we try to understand what it says the meaning of an expression as uttered on a particular occasion is either one the behavioral stimulus that produces the utterance 
to the behavioral response that the utterance produces or three, a combination of both. Thus, the meaning of fire as uttered on a particular occasion might include running or calling for help. But even on a single occasion, it is possible that not everyone who hears fire will respond by running or calling for help. So the point is, what is then meaning? It is whatever uh, stimulates me to say the word or whatever comes out as the consequence of the, of the consequence of hearing the word. That is the meaning of it. That is practically what I do, how I react uh, to some word or how I accept it or under which situation, the situation under which I, I, I sort of, I, I pronounce it. So that very thing, my behavior would be uh, the meaning of the word. There is nothing more than that. Uh, both with the additional theory and the behaviorist theory, there is a common problem. They cannot uh, perhaps explain the fact that uh, words, words unite with each other to make sentences. And there is kind of a composition, right? There are rules. And not only that, uh, also uh, we must notice that the meanings uh, the meanings also unite to give the meaning of the sentence. This part uh, is, so how ideas, so there is, uh, as far as we know, uh, there is no rule book for, com for combining ideas or there is no rule book for combining uh, stimuli or responses, right? So that would be difficult. Now, when these things were going on, uh, a great mathematician uh, philosopher called, called Frigge came up with a wonderful theory which we shall discuss uh, in details. Uh, uh, but anyways, uh, the whole picture changed when Frigge uh, work, started working on uh, all these theories and he came up with a very different idea uh, about semantics. Now, uh, we shall go through uh, a very short tour, uh, a historical tour. We'll try to see what formal semantics uh, is. So it's a brief historical sketch. Roughly speaking, formal semantics studies meanings of linguistic expressions such as words, phrases, and sentences. Now, very important, look at the word formal. It is a set of formal systems. We will study formal systems. Um, in the second in the second session this discipline is pioneered by richard montague uh, richard montague his date is uh, 1930 to 1971 he died at the age of before it was this discipline was called uh, um, formal semantics it was called montague grammar so then um, we'll see the evolution of it so here is a very uh, short uh, history of its development. So we start with the Greek philosopher Aristotle. Already we mentioned Plato, his Cratylus and his theory of reference. But here, as I said that uh, semantics is, well, semantics has been a part of uh, traditional linguistics. Uh, it can be described as a monolithic thing somehow, but definitely formal semantics is not monolithic. So we need to talk about different uh, disciplines so and uh, different thinkers. They come from different fields and all that stuff. We start with Aristotle, who for the first time in, um, the, in the Western philosophy talked about logic and uh, semantics. And uh, he was the pioneer of uh, Western logic. And for, for nearly 2000 years, what people understood as logic was only Aristotelian logic. So definitely we need to talk about him. Uh, according to him, uh, meanings, meanings are of several types. So uh, mainly they're of two types. So that is one typology. So a simple form and uh, 
a composite form. So for example, man is a simple form, but when you have a man runs, it is a composite form. Only a composite form can be true or false. You can see already he has kind of uh, kind of an understanding of what we now call a preposition. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about uh, prepositions and statements and all that stuff. But uh, he, he, he understands that man is neither true nor false. Runs is neither true nor false. When they unite, uh, when they come together, you get something which is entitled to have a truth value. So basically a statement is something uh, which is entitled to have a truth value. So already uh, this composite form is, uh, is kind of a primitive statement. Aristotle believed there were 10 categories such as substance, quality, quantity, space, time, etc. These are the meanings of simple forms. So the entire Aristotelian philosophy, in a sense, uh, is based on uh, this kind of categoriology, this kind of typology of elements. And we can see that it was somehow semantic, not that it was very, uh, very strictly semantic all the time. Uh, sometimes it seems to be, the typology seems to be slightly confused and all that stuff. But despite all odds and everything, we can see that it is mostly semantic. Now, it will not be irrelevant to say that this kind of semantic typology uh, was a very important tool in the, his, in the history of uh, philosophy. So, uh, as far as we know, uh, there are two civilizations that somehow developed logic. Not the same logic, two different logics, the Greeks and the Indians. But across cultures, we can see that this uh, 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 linguistic or semantic typology uh, as a basis for philosophical understanding uh, is common. Uh, we'll, we can also see this, the same tendency in uh, Indian philosophy, especially uh, in, in Vaisheshika philosophy. Vaisheshikas are the, uh, are the physicists in some sense. So they talk about uh, objects. So for them it's very important to also at the same time classify objects. So they believe in seven uh, categories uh, which they call padarthas and uh, we'll see once again it's a semantic typology. It comes directly from the grammarian. So the Sanskrit grammarians uh, said that there were words of four types words denoting substances, words denoting attributes, words denoting actions, and words denoting universals. So in Sanskrit, substance, dravya, attribute, guna, action, karma, and universal, samanya, or jati. So you get four categories. I'm, I'm talking about the seven categories of the Vaisheshikas. So you get four from these four, which directly come from the grammarians. Then you have the negative words. For example, uh, he is non-human or uh, something is uh, immortal, not mortal. So you, f you find this uh, im or non that is a negative particle. Also, you, you find something like he is not moving, which means that he has the absence of movement. All these uh, negative words, negative expressions could, be, could mean one thing, that is absence which is another category, which could be understood as the fifth category or whatever. Then how come we have seven categories? There are two, two more which we require. The unique particular, which uh, the Vaisheshikas called Vishesha. That is the reason uh, the whole philosophy is called Vaisheshika philosophy. Uh, this is very, uh, very tightly associated with the Vaisheshika theory of atoms. We know that Vaisheshikas are the first atomists, uh, perhaps way before anybody else talked about atoms, Vaisheshikas did. So, uh, so an atom must have a Vishesha. Uh, we are not talking about this, so it's very important uh, for them to have this, otherwise the other categories cannot be supported. And then inherence. So you have a substance, for example, say uh, a box, 
and you have an attribute, say it's color, suppose it's a red box. Now the point is, how does the red color, uh, how, how, how does the, the red color get related uh, to, this, to this box? For this, they have to invent kind of a different, uh, different category which they call inherence. So the red color resides in the box through inherence. So you can see that these two, the unique particular and the inherence are kind of supportive categories. So that is how you have seven categories of the Vaisheshika. And you can clearly see that it, it is based on kind of a semantic classification. And then they would do logic. So in fact, the early logicians of India uh, would merge. So as a school, as a, as a school logicians merged with Vaisheshikas uh, to make kind of uh, a kind of a scientific school, kind of a school that would talk about things uh, through debating, which is called Navya Nyaya. And the merging happened some time uh, in 6th or 7th century AD. And uh, we can see that once again, uh, one important basis for that was this semantic classification, which we see the, the tendency is also seen in the works of Aristotle. Anyways, we get back to Aristotle and his philosophy. Aristotle analyzed a declarative sentence such as Socrates is mortal or all men are mortal or uh, no man is mortal. Like we are taking all declarative sentences into two parts. Socrates or all men, these are subjects and mortal, that's the predicate. He called is or are the copula. So a subject gets related or gets glued uh, uh, with a predicate through the copula. That was uh, Aristotle's idea. Uh, and then we skip a few centuries, in fact quite a few centuries, and we come to this time, 1596, 1650, uh, René Descartes, uh, the French philosopher, scientist, mathematician, uh, he believed that a universal language called lingua universalis underlie all the speech. This structure represented the human reason. So in a sense, if you wanted to represent human reason, you would have to do that through this uh, lingua universalis. Otherwise, because reason is not tied up to a specific language or a culture. Uh, so in that case, but at the same time, reason uh, reason must be represented. If if I want to explicitly uh, represent reason, I need uh, elements that that are linguistic. Otherwise, how do I represent it at all? So, what would be the language of reason? So, it would be this lingua universalis, and that language uh, must underlie all human languages. This was uh, uh, this was a Cartesian assumption, and uh, then. Following Descartes, Leibniz said that uh, uh, he also believed in Leibniz, the German philosopher who invented calculus. Today's calculus actually is his brainchild. He did a lot, lot of other things. He was a great physicist, definitely a philosopher, a mathematician, a very, very great thinker. He believed in the Cartesian dream, the dream of lingua universalis. So uh, he, uh, this was his dissertation. So it's called Dissertatio de Arte Combinatoria. It's the art of combination. Uh, and in this, uh, this, this was his uh, uh, research dissertation. He called the general framework of, for, for such a universal language Characteristica Universalis. The framework would contain simple signs for simple concepts and Ars Combinatoria, or the art of combination, for combining those simple signs and for building complex signs that would stand for complex ideas. Also, the framework should have the proper analysis of such combinations. So not only does it, not only does it have uh, signs like alpha, beta, gamma and stuff, also it has rules for combining those, uh, those things and making a structure like alpha, beta. That is actually Arte Combinatoria. 
So the art of combination, how do I combine? Not that every combination is a good combination. For example, you can see in, in an ordinary language, when I s if I say that I are sleeping, definitely you will tell me that this is a bad combination, I and R. Why bad? You need a lot of theories to say that. But the point is, this is a bad combination. So uh, not that every combination of signs is okay. So so the combination must be rule bound. What are the rules? So uh, the Leibnizian characteristic universalis will have to have the rules for combination. And then comes Frigga. You can consider him the central figure as far as uh, formal semantics or modern semantics is concerned. Montague borrowed so much from him. In fact, the entire semantic model Montague built is based on Frege's principle of compositionality, which we are going to discuss in detail. He rejected, Frege rejected the Aristotelian analysis of a sentence. We'll talk about that, why he rejected. For him, a sentence has mainly two parts. Namely, proper names that are saturated and unsaturated concept words. In a sentence, like all men are mortal, both men and mortal are concept words, whereas Socrates is a proper name in a sentence, such as Socrates is a man. So, look, uh, the, the very analysis, the very uh, equation, that, the very effort they, that equated uh, all men and Socrates would then be wrong. Why? Because uh, Socrates is saturated. So we'll understand, we'll study the very idea of saturation uh, in the second or third uh, session maybe. Uh, but here you find, you already find an unsaturated thing that is, uh, that is man. For example, how do I know? I can say Socrates is a man. So something is a man. You see, when I say Socrates, you feel fine Socrates, but I cannot say man, right? That is unsaturated. So when man and Socrates, uh, when man and Socrates unite, so in a sense, you have a complete structure. But Socrates is in a sense complete in itself, whereas man is not, or is man, is definitely, is a man, is definitely not saturated. We'll talk about it later. Uh, and then, according to him, Frigga, every linguistic expression expresses a sense and refers to a reference. So this is, in a sense, it is getting back to the old referential theory, but it is uh, far more complex than any referential theory people saw before. So uh, thus the expression, the morning star, uh, expresses some sense that leads one to its reference, which is the planet Venus. So the sense is kind of a path which leads one to uh, a destination and uh, that is the reference. So uh, so every, so the, the so meaning now uh, once again is not a, not a unit. So for, for Frigga, meaning has at least two different aspects. One, the path through which one is led to the reference, the object. Frigga famously demonstrated that the reference of a proper name was an object and that of a concept word was a function. What I mean by a function is a mathematical function. Frigga was a mathematician. Finally, the reference of a declarative sentence was a truth value. Uh, a truth value is either one or zero. One means true and uh, zero means false. Many of his ideas would eventually be absolutely central to formal semantics. Frigga was the first person to, uh, to remove a lot of confusions as far as uh, meaning is concerned. Uh, because before that, some people thought meanings were ideational things. These are ideas. But ideas are subjective things. Uh, at the same time, we cannot, we cannot deny that there is some mental object associated, some mental element or some mental side to, uh, to linguistic understanding. What is it? Uh, if I do not know English, there is no point in telling me something in English. 
uh, i understand when somebody says that there is a there is a dog on the street i understand if i understand english now the point is uh, what is this understanding so we understand uh, is it what is meaning is it the thing we understand or is it the thing that is out there on the street the meaning is in a sense both so uh, as far as the understanding part of part is concerned it is the sense and as far as the thing out there is concerned it is the reference this is how it has got two parts and now Frege for the first time said even sense although it looks mental uh, even this is not ideational this is not you know somehow it has nothing to do with somebody's personal uh, idea or something like that this is not subjective this is also objective for example he uh, he here uses his famous telescope uh, analogy he says that uh, uh, the moon is seen through a telescope right now when you see the moon through a telescope from one angle you have one uh, one picture or one image formed uh, in your telescope right one image of uh, of the moon and that will not vary but uh, so that that is objective but you have to see that so you have to have access uh, to to that image already formed in that sense both sense and reference associated with a word are objective so there is no subjective personal element that is how he was very much against uh, any psychologistic idea so uh, the meaning either sense or reference of a word the meaning is not uh, like pain or pleasure which are subjective so this is one thing Frege clarifies we'll see that anyway so he comes up uh, with a rigorous system of logic and he in true sense is the pioneer of modern logic this system he called concept script in German Begriffsschrift it is a formal system that contains logical constants such as and or etc quantifiers such as all and some and signs for concepts and objects his notation was very complicated so after Frege worked uh, after Frege worked on this Begriffsschrift Russell came up with another a uh, rigorous logical uh, text both russell and white in fact and it is called the principia mathematica it represented a full fledged formal logical system that was mathematically rigorous with a simpler notation the great works by tarski wittgenstein and other logicians mathematicians made formal logic an independent discipline in the first half of the 20th century The Cartesian dream about lingua universalis came true when Noam Chomsky started his cognitive revolution in 1950s and 60s. He talked about the universal grammar. So the moment you talk about the universal grammar, you assume that yes, there is some kind of lingua, lingua universalis. Chomsky introduced the formal system to the study of language. For the first time, linguistics became formal in the true sense. Uh, we'll explore the meaning of this word formal anyway in the very second session of this course. Logicians such as Russell and Strawson claimed that there was no exact logic in the natural language. Now we are slowly uh, going towards uh, formal semantics. Now here is a negative point. Although Russell and Strawson, these very great logicians, uh, they believe that if you want to do scientific things, you need a flawless, perfect language. But natural language, any natural language is flawed. Why? Because uh, they can be ambiguous. What is ambiguity? For example, um, uh, when I say that stout major's wife, this structure is ambiguous because it can either mean the major is stout and his wife or it can mean that um, 
it can mean that uh, major's wife and that wife is that wife is stout right so we can see that this is structurally ambiguous there are many such ambiguous uh, constructs in in our day-to-day uh, -day language so uh, and there are many other defects of uh, of uh, the natural language therefore the techniques of logic could not be used for studying the structure of natural languages uh, and in in his syntactic structures Chomsky too expressed his doubts about connecting syntax to semantics through a rigorous formal system. Uh, although Chomsky believed in, uh, in, in the universal grammar, also he believed in lingua universalis, he could not really have much trust in a formal system of semantics. So it, it is because everybody doubted the meaning part of natural language. The structural part uh, now would be perfect with the works of Chomsky. It will be perfected rather. Finally, Montague's famous paper, The Proper Treatment of Quantification in Ordinary English, established a formal semantic system. When uh, these great logicians like uh, Montague, sorry, like Russell and Strawson were against doing natural language semantics or against doing against uh, formalizing semantics montague was a student uh, as i said he was born in uh, 1930 and he first had a ba in philosophy and then uh, he had an ma in mathematics and then he graduated with a phd degree uh, in the year 1957 he worked with a great logician, Tarski, whose works are also very, very important for any almost central to any logical system and absolutely important for any formal semantic system. So, uh, and then um, Montague started teaching at, uh, at uh, UCLA uh, uh, and then he taught there till his death. So uh, he didn't. He was not very happy with the idea that uh, nobody uh, could do any serious, any any rigorous stuff, any formal stuff through natural language. So what was the point? Russell's point was, or these these logicians' point was, uh, that you couldn't formalize the meaning part of language already. Its structure was somehow formalized by Chomsky. We will see that in our third session, how the structure of the syntactic structure of languages, natural languages, uh, uh, was sort of formalized. But then the meaning part could not be formalized. So, so to say, uh, in a sense, the logicians uh, like uh, Russell and Strawson thought that artificial languages have a structure, but no such structure uh, could be imposed on natural languages. They're different. Uh, they don't have any any specific structure. So, uh, so they said that uh, uh, they, they thought that natural languages were messy. No exact logic could ever understand it. But in Universal Grammar, uh, which was published in 1970, Montague fam famously claimed, there is, in my opinion, no important theoretical difference between natural languages and the artificial languages of logicians. Indeed, I consider it possible to comprehend the syntax and semantics of both kinds of languages with a single natural and mathematically precise theory. This was the central point uh, of his works. Uh, especially his PTQ, uh, the name of that is the proper treatment of quantification in ordinary English. He created kind of a homomorphism. He showed that some structure, uh, suppose S1, exists in, in an artificial language. So, and then a counterpart of that would also exist in a natural language. 
So uh, almost the same structure would capture both a natural language and an artificial language. And uh, a natural language is as systematic as an artificial language. So uh, much of this thing what I said is taken from uh, from this. Actually it is, uh, it is a presentation by Professor Barber Party and uh, it has very important information about the the history of semantics. Well, then uh, when all these things were happening, there was somebody called Professor Bar Hillel, or I, I, I'm not very sure of my pronunciation of it, who kept saying, he, he was insistent, he kept saying that natural language is all fine. You, uh, I believe that something can be done. I believe that you can discover the, the perfect logic of, uh, of natural language, but nobody uh, listened to him. So, in a sense, Bar Hillel approached uh, Montague. He kept saying, Montague was a student at that time, he kept saying that you may try uh, to do something in that field. And finally, Montague came up uh, with his uh, PTQ and with his universal grammar and uh, with uh, practically with many other, uh, many other works and uh, those works together established the new discipline called formal semantics. Then uh, we will see, uh, okay, the entire uh, course will be based on uh, this book. It is our textbook, Introduction to Montague Semantics by Doughty, Wall and Peters, 1981. This is a book that helps us understand Montague's PTQ. Uh, it is technical but it is it has a wonderful pedagogy so it will guide us through uh, a, a, a wonderful wonderfully designed uh, path and uh, our journey will be guided by by this now the topics covered uh, we start with formal systems because we are talking about formal semantics what is a formal system uh, as this is an introductory class, I should introduce all these words at least and then we have the detailed understanding of that. So, a formal system uh, is based on some uh, primitive symbols like S1, S2, whatever and rules, rules for combinations. Any formal system would have that, uh, that principle. By doing that, uh, it does two things. One, it combines some, some things and it blocks some constructions. So, uh, there is, uh, so the agenda is to make the desired constructions, to cook up the desired constructions and to block the undesired constructions. For example, uh, a formal grammar would allow or would would help me cook up a sentence like John is wise. There would be rules for uh, cooking up this sentence but the same grammar also must block the must block a construction like John are wise right this should be blocked. So, so this uh, it has got this twofold agenda. Then we shall study formal syntax and uh, here this will be based on, this session will be based on syntactic structure of Noam Chomsky uh, and then we will do formal logic. I will, uh, I will mention the textbooks whenever we uh, do something. After that we need to cover, we need to understand, uh, we need to have very basic understanding of set theory and functions. So, the mathematical uh, theories about set, sets and functions we need to do. Um, I will try to start it from the scratch and uh, I think it will be pretty easy. And then a very important uh, section, Frigga's philosophy of language. Already I mentioned sense and reference and uh, most importantly his uh, compositionality principle that 
the the reference of a concept word uh, so for example when you say that socrates is a man in a symbolic form ms uh, the 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 reference of man is actually a function and the reference of socrates is is somebody whoever it is and uh, what actually happens is uh, the it's an entity this function takes this entity and yields a truth value because socrates is a man somehow the function uh, within the structure of the function socrates is actually mapped uh, to one and then when socrates joins man one is yielded as a truth value so uh, this is precisely uh, his compositionality principle so the entire so this is the artica minatoria uh, leibniz talked about so this is a vivid and rigorous artica minatoria in in that sense in the leibnizian sense after having uh, done the foundational things i think there would be something like six sessions on the foundational things um, after having covered the foundational things we'll go to uh, the real part the central part of it uh, propositional semantics now uh, also we'll uh, we have to do propositional logic formal logic we'll do propositional logic and also predicate logic bit of it we will see some deduction some rule and stuff like that and then we'll do propositional semantics so uh, here in propositional semantics we will consider uh, for example sentence uh, sentence variables and sentence constants so like p q we are, we, we are not going to split p and q and then uh, our most important things will be uh, uh, the things like the logical operators like and or if then not and all that stuff and their combinations so uh, it's very important to see the homomorphism montague all the time talked about what is it that is the reason everything every model has got two versions the uh, the the artificial version and the the language version so l0 is the artificial version it is a constructed it's an artificial language and l0e is like english it's not exactly english but it's pretty much like english the same applies to this predicate semantics in predicate semantics will split uh, will peep into the very structure of a sentence p and that of a sentence q we analyze a sentence for example um, take socrates is a man uh, in this model that is the propositional model it will be represented just as p but in predicate semantics we split it into m and s or for example if i want to say that a man exists we would split this the whole idea as there exists an x such that x is a man so this splitting is done by predicate semantics or predicate logic once again it will have two versions why two versions so l0 it will have certain rules r1 through rn and this l0e also will have some rules say for example s1 through sn we'll see that the structure of these rules is not very different from the structure of uh, these rules so there is kind of a kind of a homomorphism essentially they the same thing only there are cosmetic differences here and there this will fulfill the montaguevian idea that there is no significant uh, theoretical difference between uh, the formal and the natural language uh, and then uh so uh, so we have once again l1 and l1e so this is this will be pretty central uh so we'll have uh, something like seven sessions on propositional and predicate semantics and then we'll go to uh we'll go to a higher order predicate semantics why higher order because um, in predicate semantics so many things cannot be defined and uh, it's a first order predicate semantics then we go to 
uh, higher order predicate semantics, which is once again predicate semantics, but uh, in this you can do a lot more than you could do in the previous languages. So the first one is L type. This is based on Russell's type theory. So here is a language based on Russell's type theory. We learn Russell's type theory and uh, uh, and then we'll also study the language called L type. And L type also has two versions, one artificial and then we'll use that artificial uh, style, artificial construction uh, for understanding uh, a natural language which is pretty much like English. Then we'll, uh, we'll have to study lambda calculus which is a mathematical tool invented by Alonso Church in 1930s, early 1930s. And uh, there is a language called L lambda which is based on uh, this lambda calculus. So we need to learn this uh, uh, the lambda calculus for doing L lambda. And uh, Finally, uh, finally, we'll do intentional semantics. What is meant by that? Uh, so far, like uh, in all these things, so uh, intentional semantics will probably have one or two sessions and what will be covered there. As I was trying to say that this was uh, the understanding of meaning as the reference. For example, if you take MS, that is Socrates is a man, uh, M will be kind of a set of men and Socrates will be an entity. So MS will relate this entity to this set, right? So both are things out there. But we did not talk about, uh, in, in all these sessions, we will not talk about, uh, for example, how I'm guided to choose one set out of many uh, when somebody says man. Right, so that that thing, which is somehow mental, I'm not saying that is psychological. I'm not saying that is subjective. It is objective, but somehow it is mental because my understanding is somehow involved in it. So this part is the intention of a word. It is kind of connotation. Connotation is very primitive intention. So it has. There will be three uh, parts there. One tense operators. So uh, we need to distinguish sentences like I, uh, I go and I went. So we need tense operators for that. And modal operators, uh, which are basically two. There is no point in talking about modal operators right now. Anyway, we'll do. And finally, intentional logic, which will talk, talk about uh, the, uh, the grand program of Frigo and how it could be formalized. So in the foundational sessions, we will, uh, 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 we will see the friggin ideas and in this session we will see the formalization of those, of those ideas. So almost everything will have two different aspects, a theoretical aspect which will be covered in the beginning and then uh, a symbolic formal aspect which will be covered towards the end. So this is how we'll have uh, roughly uh, 20 classes and uh, that's how we'll try to understand formal semantics. Thank you.